I gave people all the stuff they really needed. Social security checks, utility bills, TV guide. I want a TV guidance counselor. Ken Reed here, your TV guidance counselor, sitting here in my palatial tiny office with my dogs and my, I'll call them collectibles, uh, <laughs> bring you another edition of TV Guidance Counselor. Our streak continues uh, since February 14, 2014. Not missed a week yet. Haven't jinxed myself either. Uh, still saying that, but here we are uh year 11 of the show my guest this week is a returning guest to the show it is author chris morgan and chris wrote the 90s uh, guide to 90s nickelodeon you had him on about a year and a half maybe two years ago uh, he also previous to that wrote a book about mystery science theater 3000 which i didn't have him on for but i am a fan uh his new book is uh, i believe 99 episodes of television that define the 90s he he goes <laughs> I could just read the title, but it's, it's, I think it's 99 episodes that define the nineties. Uh, it's really cool. If you like this show, you'll like his stuff. If you haven't already checked it out, you can get it on Amazon or wherever books are sold. Uh, and also if you want to shoot me an email at TV guidance counselor, gmail.com or Kenneth, I can read.com or social media at Kenneth W read or at TV guidance. Let me know what episodes of 90s TV you think to find the 90s. Give me like your top five. Uh, or even better, if you have a dollar a month or more, you can become a patron of the show at patreon.com backslash TV Guidance Counselor, and we can discuss it there with the other patrons and fans of the show. Uh, maybe we can come up with the top five as a group, collectively. Uh, and if you're $5 and up a month, you'd get a PDF of this week's episode uh, guide, the one we look at uh, on this show with, uh, with <laughs> that fine wooden suit on... Uh, Tim Allen. Anyway, uh, let's get into it. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this week's episode of TV Guidance Council with my returning guest, Chris Morgan. TV is my friend, and it has been always there for me in time with me. Live via satellite from still Detroit, I think? Yes. Chris Morgan, how are you again? I'm doing all right. Good to be back. Good to, uh, you know, be part of this thing again. Because the first time I did this, looking through the uh, TV guide, maybe it was like, I have to do this again if I can. Because just to get access to more TV guides, I got to come back. <laughs> Interesting tactic. Uh, there are probably easier ways to get access to them. But, you know, I can't fault you for it. Uh, you know, set my mind on something and then everything else fell by the wayside. Let Linear thinking, not lateral thinking. Right. Well, you do have a, a but you do have a book come, another book coming up. That is true. Fair. Yes. Yeah. I um, mean, it's ninety nine episodes that define the nineties. Is that? Uh, yeah, ninety nine episodes that define the nineties. Colon, um, TV milestones from Arsenio to Homer to yada yada yada. The nature of the modern uh, book writing world. You got to have a long subtitle right. that th throws as many SEO related things in there as possible. It's just just how it goes these days. But yeah, so that's the full title. If you just if people out there wanted to find it, uh, yeah, ninety nine episodes that define the nineties. It's simple enough. You don't have to commit the whole thing. To yeah, and I put a link in the show description too. Uh, yeah. The uh, like that's the also very profile, helpful. But yes. um, so. Presumably, it is what it says it is. There's 99 episodes from the 90s. Uh, are they in like an order of like 99 to 1, or are they just like, here's 99? They're in chronological order. Good call. Uh, yeah, I, I went from a, yeah. So basically, you know, the book is a, you know, one of those things where the premise is in the title, like, you know, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, which is in the book and also a title that explicates itself, mm -hmm. Buffy Slays Vampires. Uh, but yeah, so it, it's about, it's 99 episodes that, um, well, you know, I felt defined the 90s as a cultural conception uh, in one way or another in the world of TV, but also, you know, film politics, because obviously there's plenty of politics in the mix. The Murphy Brown episode that Dan Quayle hated, for example, mm -hmm. that's in the book and what have you. So yeah, but then I did order them uh, organizing principle wise from uh, earliest to latest. Um, so it runs the gamut of the pilot episode of Twin Peaks, 
to the first episode of Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, where somebody won a million dollars, and uh, 97 things in between there that people can find out, you know, with the book, or just ask me. I, yeah, if I want to open episodes of the book, just ask me. I'm not going to... a lot of years. Yeah. I did, yeah. was there, were there any um, curveballs in there, or anything that you, like, you were surprised you included? Hmm. Um, in terms of trying to think of any episode where I was like, oh, I landed on that episode. I mean... It didn't get, there's not a lot that's esoteric in there. I did include cop rock. So that's, you know, in terms of things that are esoteric. Which, to be the, fair, isn't that bad. It's definitely, it's, it's interesting. It's it's a big swing, which makes it better than a lot of, like, shows that, you know, are short-lived and kind of generic. Uh, cop rock, at least, you know, it's a little knowing. So it can be, but it's really, it depends on how much you can accept the uh, whole idea of, you know, song and dance integration and storytelling, which obviously some people love that sort of thing, which is why musicals are so sure. successful. And Broadway's More been so, going well for yeah. quite a while. <laughs> yeah, you know, so people, but it was still, it was a, it was a, not quite the chocolate in the peanut butter, peer butter, the chocolate thing maybe they were hoping for. Like people love police procedurals, people love, you know, integrated musicals where people break into song and dance. But, uh, so, I'm, yeah, I'm trying to think of if there's any episodes that were when I landed on the show that, oh, it's like, oh, this episode. Because, like, some of them are obvious. Like, the Arsenio episode I chose is Bill Clinton playing mm-hmm. the saxophone. Yep. You know, it's like, it uh, has to be sort of covered in, in the mix there. Uh, some of them is, like, trying to figure out the shows I want to cover. For example, uh, it'll come up later in this episode based on the issue that I chose. I'm not, you know, leading into that now. There's plenty more uh, sure. to yep. sort of discuss, but just because it popped in my head, um, it's Third Rock from the Sun. And because I, you know, was like, oh, how is that a way to really get that show into the book? Um, and then I was like, they did a uh, episode that was the lead out from the Super Bowl. Yes. And so I could talk about the whole idea of the Super Bowl lead out episode. So I was like, ah, so that's like sort of like worked backwards in a way of being like, I don't, it's like, I would like to close the show. I don't know an episode that I could immediately grab. Right. Uh, there's the sort of justification to do it. Whereas with some other shows, it's like, well, I know it's obviously I'm going to, you know, choose like this or that or, uh, but some other ones. Um, Did you do the same amount of episodes per year or are there any years that are like more heavy than others? There are definitely some years that ended up heavier than others. I feel like 1998 ended up a little heavy and then like one of the years in the early 90s ended up a little light. I feel like 93 would be light. (laughs) I feel like that may have been what it was. I didn't want to say for like certain it was like 93, but I feel like, yeah, I was like, because um, uh, there's like one year where it's like, oh, my Simpsons episode and my fr- uh, Friends episode. And it's like, so it's like heavy hitters. And it's like all from like the same year. Whereas like there's one in the early 90s. I'm like, oh, this year I only ended up with a couple, you know, few uh, episodes. Because, yeah, it was about picking the shows that I felt would, you know, cover things well and then picking the episodes. And I felt like, you know, giving a certain year sort of less coverage wouldn't necessarily be giving it short shrift of it, like, you know, didn't earn it. I don't want to be like, right. It's an well, honest gotta, uh, collection. Yeah. yeah. I got to, I got to find an episode of, from 1993 of, from like, you know, I believe that's when the cheer series finale ended. And that's in the book. Cause it's sort of like one of the last cultural moments of the eighties, which in a way really made it kind of fit into the nineties. Cause it was like, here's a moment where like, Maybe the 80s, such as it is, truly ended with the ending of Cheers. But, you know, I was going to be like, well, is there an episode of Platypus Man to cover here? Just because it's like... <laughs> Shasta I gotta, McNasty, yeah, uh, Homeless in Outer Space. Yeah, now Shasta McNasty, I think maybe I consider it for a second. But that was like an early cut of being like, uh, no, I got enough stuff to cover. I, and I got Cop Rock in here for like an interest. I mean... That's at least more of an interesting fiasco. Like Shasta McNasty is just like a weird failure with a funny name. Yeah, a, a, a deserved failure, or like something like the Secret Diary of Desmond Pfeiffer. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Then you're skating to like the shows that are just sort of like you know infamously bad. At that point, I might as well just try and 
weave in. I, it's all American shows, but I think there's that old British sitcom, Hile Honey, I'm Home, or whatever that famous. Yeah, but that was like in the 70s. I feel yeah. Like, was, like the fact that they did Desmond <laughs> Pfeiffer like, is when insane. They, yeah. Like when I had Eric, Eric Deggins on the show, who's the NPR um, TV and movie critic, he mm. had an amazing story about going to the upfronts and they showed that episode. Uh, like the pilot of Desmond Pfeiffer, and he said, he, you know, he was the only black guy there, mm-hmm. and he got up to ask a question, and he just went, "Brother, what made you think this was a good idea?" <laughs> like that's literally his question, and it it's true. Like there's no other question you could ask about that yeah. show. <laughs> it just bonkers. yeah. Um, so I'm looking forward to it. I, I'm curious. Though, I'm sure there'll be some surprises in there for me. I get uh, I, I'm a little less strong at the back half of the '90s. Right. Um, which interestingly enough, you kind of picked here. Uh, ah, yes. You picked a ninety-seven, I believe, uh, September nineteenth to twenty-fifth, nineteen ninety-seven. Uh, mm-hmm. This has Detroit's own uh, Tim Allen on the cover <laughs> in a, a jacket. I didn't notice this initially, but his jacket is like a wood grain. Yeah, suit literally, coat. my first note I wrote down was Tim Allen's suit because yeah, it's like that's partially why I did choose this because Tim Allen is you know Detroit's own you know in a way uh, you know I've done. You know, uh, when I've you know the only comedy club, like true comedy club, I've ever done stand up at. I, I haven't done like a ton of stand up. I did more performing wise. I would do more improv than stand up. And even when I did stand up, it'd be still like doing it at a bar or what have you. Because like, there's only like one like comedy club of like you know a true sense of the old word here in the area, and it's Mark Ridley's Comedy Castle. And uh, you know their their kind of fame, even when I was like doing stuff there many years later was that Tim Allen had been, you know, there regularly back in the day after his, you know, famous, and it's mentioned in this interview in like, you know, the centerpiece of the, uh, this issue is when he was like, he's, you know, he got busted for Coke mm-hmm. and then he went to prison, he got out, started doing stand up, and, you know, so, but yeah. And then of course, home improvement set in the, uh, Metro Detroit area. I don't think they ever named no, the suburb. I don't think so either. Yeah, yeah the three was, three famous comedians famously started doing stand up after they were in prison. Can you name the other two? Uh, I mean, I feel like it would make sense if Sam Kinison was one of them. No, not Kinison, um, hmm. but uh, on the right track. Uh, uh, one is Rodney Dangerfield. Oh, I'm, uh, I knew. He, yeah, you knew he'd been like a. A loom siding salesman or something yep. back in the day. He went day, to jail for kind of being a bit of a con man, and when he mm. got out, um, the other is Red Fox, who was cellmates with Malcolm X. <laughs> I feel like I didn't know that, but then yeah, I, I, for, I forgot that. Yeah, I wouldn't oh, put man. Tim Allen in the same category as them, <laughs> aside from that one fact. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's uh, oh, an organizing uh, principle that brings them all together in the in the Cliff Clavin three people that have never been in my you know in my kitchen, kitchen sort yeah. of way. Yeah. But yeah, so there there was that aspect of it. And also, I ended up choosing one, uh, you know, later '90s because I wanted to choose. The first time I did this, I was promoting my Nickelodeon book. I chose the episode that I chose the cover that had Larissa Olenek and Irene Eng, who played Shelby Wu, on the cover because it was fitting. And that, but I wanted to choose something from because as the '90s went on, I was more actively choosing what I was like watching myself. Is less what the family's watching, more what I was watching, and there'd be like more options. And I was, you know, watching things that would be more sort of adult-ish, pushing in sort of that direction. And so I wanted to be like picking like a year where there was a chance that I was actually choosing to watch some of these things in prime time. And also having Tim Allen on the cover and, uh, you know, representing Detroit and wearing his, his wood sort of paneled sort of suit and everything. And also because he's just, it's weird, like, this was sort of like the tail end of Tim Allen as not just like a relevant cultural figure, but like a significant cultural figure, which is like a weird thing, though, because like, it was a home improvement, huge sitcom. He had the Santa Claus film. He had the Toy Story movies. He was like, you know, a big 90s star. Bigger stars, of course, because, you know, there was more monoculture then, so there's more stars sure. then. But, I mean, like, relatively speaking, and the way, like, we talk about, like, TV ratings and, like, what's big now would have been nothing back then. On the reverse side, like, Tim Allen as a cultural figure was probably, you know, bigger than, you know, most people on TV now. He just wasn't as big as, you know, 
the cast of Friends or something like right, that. Right, but few people were. It's it's funny because you saying that reminds me, and one of the things I talk about on the show all the time is the the shift from people to be TV actors into movie actors, mm-hmm. and how there was some real surprises, like Bruce Willis, Woody Harrelson, like, oh, great, but you wouldn't, out of the cast they were in, you wouldn't go, that guy's going to be a movie star. And then a bunch of people that they pushed to try to become movie stars that you thought would be that didn't work, like John Ritter and John Larroquette and Kirstie Alley. Um, <clears throat> but Tim Allen made that shift. He became a movie star. Yeah. But no one ever thinks of him like that <laughs> at all. It's funny. Yeah. I never think of him as a movie actor. But he's had more successful movies than not. <laughs> like, yeah. he was a box I mean, office guy. Yeah. The, the, you know, even if you just you know say, like, well, Toy Stories, it's sort of like own thing. It's like the Santa Claus was a Tim Allen vehicle that was successful and had yep. multiple sequels. I mean, I feel like Galaxy Quest more of a cult favorite uh, he had what was uh, was which Disney movie was his was his Jungle the Jungle? Yes, I think so. I think he yeah. might have had more than one. And then was that yeah, other one Wild Hogs? <laughs> oh yeah, and he had a, he had a, you know probably another one or two there in the '90s for sure. But yeah, he was you know able to have movie success. You know, yeah, not like in a sustained way, but you know, again, if you see why they compare it to the movie careers of like a. Courtney Cox or Lisa Kudrow or David Schwimmer or most of the cast of Friends, Tim Allen beats all of them other than definitely Jennifer Anderson and give or take a Matthew Perry. Yeah. Uh, you know, so he was you know a, a big significant star during his time there. And he had he's, you know, one of the more successful of the stand up turned sitcom actors as well. In terms of not just this sitcom, but also like the other ones didn't really have movie careers either. It's not, you know, it's like even the very, like, you know, Jerry Seinfeld or Drew Carey or even Roseanne Barr. Right. Paul Reiser's like, the only one I can think of that has a yeah. successful movie career. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But so it is weird to think about like his success compared to people you put in a similar box or people who you don't think of as peers, but are kind of peers. It feels weird to be, you know, talking so well about Tim Allen, a guy whose politics are terrible oh, yeah. and whose comedy is, you know, not great. Yep. Uh, but it's just like, you know, culturally, not, it's it's interesting. Yeah, yeah, he's a very interesting cultural figure, and it's also just fun to be like he's like one of the like sort of Detroit, Michigan sort of like centric figures in like culture, and certainly like back then, and so that's you know. You know, in a way, it just, it, it just tied into a little bit. Because, I mean, I'm not, I don't represent or rep everybody who's got Detroit ties. I'm not going to be here talking up Kid Rock, for example, you oh know. God. That's but, two uh, bad examples. If you come up yeah. with a third, I'm just going to hang up. Uh, oh, another bad. <laughs> uh, well, it depends how you feel about Jack Kevorkian, I guess. Kevorkian, did you say? Yeah, I just think that's a Detroit guy. I believe, I believe he was to a degree. He may have been from around See, here. See, I'd put I know, that in the plus column. He'd be in there yeah. with Jack White and Iggy, Iggy Pop. And, yeah, you know. I just know his lawyer was Jeffrey Feiger, uh, who is a local guy. Uh, and, like, you know, I still see Feiger Law ads, even though I don't think he's a... Uh, but he, he was his lawyer, and then he ran... Uh, Feiger ran for governor uh, back in the day, and he's, like, a, a known local Michigan figure. Now I'm being a little too esoteric in terms of talking when about said, Jack of Orkin's lawyer who you ran said, for governor When you said Fiker, Fiker Law ads, I thought you were going to say, I still see Fiker live, <laughs> like he does shows <laughs> or something. Um, also, just thinking about it, um, you know, I guess Jim Carrey's technically a stand-up, so his mm. movies go there, too. That, yeah, um, but the true. only other one I can think of is Janine Garofalo, who had a mm. huge movie career. Yeah. Um, I think... The thing that sets Tim Allen apart, aside from everything we've said that we obviously are not fans, he never did a dramatic role. No. All those other people did like a turn dramatic. Michael Keaton, that's another one, took that did yeah. that dramatic turn, and that's what kind of blew them up as movie stars. And I, unless I'm mistaken or missing something, I don't think he ever even tried. Yeah, I don't. I, I mean, if it feel very strange, it'd be like. You know, speaking of like failed sort of uh, uh, stand-ups to sitcom stars to um, movie careers, uh, it'd be like if Ellen DeGeneres tried to do like serious acting. Right. I feel like, you know, I just I can't imagine. But even like did, Dane Cook tried it. You know, like you yeah, have, he was in Mr. Brooks. Yeah, <laughs> or like Albert Brooks did it amazingly, oh, yeah. like in Drive, especially. He's oh yeah, so good. You know. Yeah, um, yeah. So it's. 
it's a strange thing. He's like one of the few that I can think of that did more than one movie, but never tried to do the serious role. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's just uh, speaking of Albert Brooks, it's not related uh, necessarily other than what he's mentioned. But did you watch that documentary? Thing I did. About I him? did. Yeah, I loved it. It was yeah, it was both interesting and substanceless. Is what I feel yeah, all about it. That's kind of what culture is like these days. Yeah, um, it's like, oh, this is it's fun to see like these clips and whatever. But it's like there's also n- no depth of this. It was like you know the, the proverbial like mile wide, inch deep, and it was a fun mile wide. Yeah, I mean I think like, that's what happens when your <laughs> best friend makes it. But it's yeah, it's it's extra interesting to me that we have in-depth documentaries about both brothers in that family like two of the three brothers like we might as well get one on the guy who doesn't do comedy (laughs) just to just to to check them all out um so let's dive into the issue here i do want to mention on the back cover uh because it's always fun the uh cigarette ad is for uh, cigarettes merits which i'm not familiar with but it has one of the laziest worst taglines i've ever seen it's just a guy smoking and it says you know it (laughs) <laughs> I'm yeah, like, what it. does that even mean? That's it. My second, also, because they were they were saying, oh, merit cigarettes. They have lower tar. That was their. Uh, and then yeah, later there's uh, an ad for uh, some another cigarette ad. And it's, it's weird to think like even in, like 1997, there's still you know prominent ads for cigarettes in publications. But there was some like I don't you know remember the uh, brand now. I just wrote down because uh, it, I tied it into there's a. I didn't really delve into this when I was reading through it, but the CMA Awards yes, were yeah. going to be happening, and they're talking. The, yeah. yeah, they're talking about uh, the girl power of like the CMA Awards, Trisha Yearwood, and I just went. Yep. Not particularly being interested in country music, and it not really being TV related. I didn't delve into that too much, but I wrote down "girl power in country" in cigarette ads because the ad, like in the middle of that, there's like an ad for like a woman. It's not from Virginia Slims or whatever. We'll get there. I'm sure we'll flip to it as I go. Yeah, we'll get to it. Uh, One thing that caught my eye here is is actually a really well written, interesting article about Heidi Klum, who everybody is is oddly much more famous now after doing several things. But this was her first sort of foray into. She's not really an actor now, like she hosts things. But this was she did a comedic role, reoccurring role on Spin City, which is a show I love, and was really funny. Uh, and and really great on a sitcom, and this is kind of an article about how um, how great that is. Yeah, yeah, I saw that one in there, and then there's also in terms of articles, um, they was they they are debuting a new feature by somebody named Dottie Enrico, yes. who is like their sort of advertising person. So I was reading through that and like the uh, the advertising um, aspect of it, and um, yeah, and so it's just like. They fun the the editor talks her up and shows fix pictures of her with like Tony the Tiger and the Pillsbury Doughboy and they talk <laughs> about the uh, Taco Bell Chihuahua and all that and then you know in the article itself one only thing I found you know well not the only thing I found interesting but one thing I found interesting is there's a little thing at the end that said called Advantage which is just telling you how much in the month of July certain companies' ads were airing. Yeah. And the top four were Burger King, McDonald's, 1-800-COLLECT, 10 10 3 2, 1, and then Geico. So it's with two of those things, very, you know, you know, bygone era. One of those things, Geico, remains ubiquitous in the ad yep. space. It just, you know, they just never have gone away. Even back then, apparently, they were already saturating the market with their ads. And, uh, you know... Certainly, you know, I remember those 10, 10, 3, 2, 1 ads and obviously don't see those anymore, but... It's long distance, yeah. And you know what <laughs> yeah. I find interesting, too, in the... This is the first time I recall seeing this in TV Guide, and I misspoke earlier. It's not 97, it's 98. Um, 98. At the end of Dottie Enrico's uh, piece, it says Dottie Enrico can be reached at .atv at AOL.com. It has an email yeah. address. <laughs> That, yeah, because I also saw, like, one of the things with that was, like, tvgen.com, which was, like, and there was, like, an app, like, some, like, website sort of thing. But, like, yeah, this is the start of, like, you can go to, like, websites for stuff like that. Because I remember around this time is when I was probably first sort of getting on the internet. I remember one of the first websites I would go to would be, was the Sci-Fi Channel's website. Yes. Because uh, they had, like, Mystery Science Theater 2000 stuff on there. And they would have these things where it's, like, here's, like, an 
image from like a movie, throw a caption on it, like a New York, like a New Yorker, like uh, at like cartoon contest, but it'd be for like some like still for a bad movie. And you know, being like you know a big fan of that show, and you know, still like my kid at the time, I was like always like we go to the Sci Fi Channel website, and I'm gonna see if I can get my little quip about this image from some monster movie on the Sci Fi Channel website yeah. that I logged onto from AOL.com. Yeah, and Monster Vision used to do that as well on on TNT. Uh-huh. That was a big. They were big on the web in the early days. Uh, I see the smoking uh, the cigarette ad you're talking about. It's between a Faith Hill and Shania Twain piece, yeah. and in fact, scrolling, I thought it was just a photo from the Shania <laughs> Twain piece. It's this woman in like leggings and a in a flannel shirt with a cup of coffee and a cigarette literally standing in a barn mm. door and it's for a cigarette called GPC Lights. Mm. Um, and again, not a great tagline, but at least better than you know it. It says best smoke of the day. <laughs> ah. <laughs> Which, you know, is, is sort of a low bar. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's true. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and then in terms of like, um, there's kind of a, other than the CMA pieces, there's a couple of sort of like big, like feature pieces about TV actors. One is the Tim Allen piece, Mm -hmm. which just delves further into Tim Allen and what's going on with his life. And uh, he's apparently he was platinum blonde at the time and premiering the, you know, promoting the the new season of Home Improvement. He's basically dressed like Guy Fieri in one of these photos. It's very strange. And uh, you're talking about his, he had had a DUI arrest and he'd gotten sober and everything like that. And I, I read through the piece and, I'll, I mean, again, I feel like I've been throwing more praise at Tim Allen than I ever imagined I would be <laughs> doing it. But it's like he comes off reasonably well in the piece, I would say, in terms of like perspective ish in terms of his life and where he's going and what have you i mean it's not a piece about politics which maybe helps it's just about a guy who is you know battling alcohol issues got sober so it's kind of easier to be sympathetic sure. in that sort of circumstance and of course the piece was written in that sense because tim allen sits down for an interview for tv guy because the piece is going to be one promoting a show and two putting him into like a positive yeah, light. Yeah, laundering his, yeah, you know, he's, so, he's getting a cleanup, yeah. But it was, you know, it was effective in that sense. And then the other one was about French Stewart, uh, you know, speaking of, uh, you know, very 90s sort of names. Uh, he, yeah, French, because it was, um, he was, you know, uh, well, people listen to Spock, they probably sure know he played uh, Harry Solomon on Third Rock from the yeah, Sun. Yeah, he was kind of the and breakout he, character on that. Yeah, he, he was like sort of like the weirdo character, like a weirdo actor, and the piece is sort of like a, it feels, now this piece is very like, of like the kind of thing they would do now where it's like, writer goes to do a thing with the, yeah. the subject. In this case, <laughs> yeah. yeah. In this case, they went to some like museum of like doll, like little dolls or something like that. And it's just like French Stewart riffing and being kind of like weird and telling stories about his like career and, you know, getting to where he is in Hollywood. And like, I, you know, uh, Third Rock from the Sun will come up later when I'm going through I'll be watching and I've already well I already brought it up as well uh that was a so during the uh I may have even said this last time I was on a depending but like during the pandemic when I got to the point of like there's nothing left to watch I had reached the end of like where I had watched every movie I'd ever like considered watching on a streaming right. service or whatever I went on the Roku channel and I watched the entire series of Third Rock from the Sun with ads that I just see the same ads over and over because one it is actually a pretty it's a it's a good show it's like it's a very silly broad sitcom but it's like a good version of that and also was like good for that kind of time because it's just such a silly show and French Stewart yeah he's like very weird in the show he also he's got some great outfits he's a he's a real sort of like 90s weird style icon in terms of like sort of retro uh, yeah it's in the kramer mold yeah. yeah he was definitely like the kramer of that quartet yes. for sure <laughs> you know that definitely was the energy they were channeling with french stewart as harry was to be the the kramer of of the of the, uh, of the piece he also yeah, had kind of a vibe of like this guy came out of nowhere but he, like he was in the, the new wkrp he was the lead in that like he had definitely mm. been around with a few misses before this yeah, and uh, speaking of new versions of old things, um, I was recently um, watching once again the uh, the classic film Teen Witch. Of course, uh, and uh, I'm trying to top that. Yeah, well, and there's the so the dude that she goes out on like the, to the dance with that has like that weird crazy energy, and he gives like a really like actual funny performance in that film. I was like, this actor, I forgot how good he is. I'm gonna look him up. 
and he was one of the new monkeys. Yeah. Yeah, which I was like, I was like, oh, yeah, I remember hearing about the new monkeys. And I was like, well, I got to check out a little bit of this new monkey stuff. So then I was delving a little further into the new monkeys. And it's that's uh, uh, because it takes sort of the energy of the monkeys, which there's some good there's some good quality to the monkeys, but it can be a lot that energy. That's a hard show to binge, for example. Yeah. Uh, But uh, they sort of took that and made a kind of like a worse version of it. Also, a more aggro version of it. Yeah, it's like so, the, it has a young ones influence as well. Yeah, and it's very yeah, for sure. weird. I I, I kind of love it because they managed <laughs> to it. It's different enough from the original, but is like yeah. a, a an evolution of the spirit that is of the times. It came out in 1987. Yeah. Um, so I I kind of liked that. <laughs> like they didn't just do a rehash. Um, and some of the songs are actually pretty good. The album's pretty great like what i yeah, want I really yeah catchy. listen to the the album what uh maybe i should yeah i was just like checking that out uh but yeah so oh one other- thing one thing i want to mention before we get to the listings is i, I noticed susan stewart's hits and misses which are like brief reviews of notable programs yeah. uh normally i kind of skip over this it's, it's usually not that exciting but um this show i have no recollection of and it must have been a huge bomb and she only gives it a four and i won't read the name of it till the end because i think it's great uh so it says uh this is cindy crawford kind of talk show and it says crawford questions experts quote in terms of erogenous zones really what are they and everyday people most are refreshingly or disarmingly frank about their private lives virgins and lesbians womenizers and therapists all share until you want to gag i know that sexual confession is in the air lately but is it really good for us to talk about these things on tv and it's an abc show which also really surprised me and the show is called sex with cindy crawford yeah that got heavy advertising <laughs> in this issue they were really going somebody put it all in to get people watching sex with there's later an ad it, it's it's called like an after after school special i think was the tagline <laughs> they used there there's a there's a lot of sex with cindy crawford in this particular issue uh which yeah i don't remember that happening um but it just uh, sounds like an executive's like guys <laughs> i got a guaranteed huge hit show just based on the title doesn't even matter what the show is we call it sex with cindy crawford everybody's gonna watch it we're gonna make so much money and that didn't happen <laughs> yeah I mean, there's only a couple other things i want to, uh, to i had for making quick notes sure. on uh one is that there's a little blurb in a brief piece about uh scooby-doo was that apparently at this point in time there was talk of Mike Myers playing Shaggy in a live action Scooby Doo yes. film, which I don't remember being the case. I was, and there's also an article that proved kind of prescient in that it's about sort of like low cost television. And it's talking about at the time kids say the darnest thing and whose lines it anyway and what have you, which turned out to be kind of like, you know, a canary in the coal mine yeah. for where TV was going. That proto reality uh, stuff. Yeah, that, that was like before, like, yeah, reality and like Survivor and all that and like, you know, all that sort of stuff came to really take over television. But yeah, that was starting to become like a thing, like the cheap, easy, like to make and produce. I mean, in a way, that's kind of what Who Wants to Be a Millionaire was. I mean, I pr- cheap to produce and like, you know, you know, block shoot episodes or whatever. Grand, you have to give people a million dollars if they want a million dollars. It's actually pretty but... cheap though in this in the scheme of things yeah. in a production. Yeah, it was yeah. it was basically the network sort of laying the groundwork for trying to build something strike proof. Which right. they sort of succeeded, but not really, and then just succeeded in like kind of ruining scripted television for about twenty years uh before, yeah. you know, there was that sort of revolution. But yeah, it, it was kind of interesting to see that for sure. Yeah, yeah, that was just uh but yeah, in terms of like the uh, blocks and the various, there's other things sort of sprinkled in the mix. Like I have like, you know, little sideways notes beyond what I was, you know, going to watch or what have you. But yeah, in terms of like the bulk of the pieces, you know, skipping over the CMA thing in general, because uh, yeah, I mean, I yeah, wouldn't have cares. any watched in that. I wouldn't have any interest <laughs> yeah. in that or whatever. It would mean nothing you know, to me. Yeah, there was Tim Allen, there was French Stewart. And there was sex with Cindy Crawford. And, That's, you know. I mean, there you go. That's 1998 in a nutshell. Yeah. Uh, let's jump to Saturday. What uh, What'd you do on Saturday night? Well, this was a this Saturday was a little, you know, a lackluster, uh, generally speaking. Uh, so, uh, in terms of like the hours uh, that were on hand, because this would have been a, a snick sort of time, but what was on. SNCC at the time was not necessarily 
particularly of note. Uh, I considered watching Charles Grodin's show just because it was funny that it was, you know, it's like, oh yeah, Charles Grodin had his like weird show or whatever. But then it's like... It was a talk show. Yeah. And it's just like, is that really like something that I actually want to see? Or is it just like, oh, like the novelty of it? I could like flip over to that during like a commercial break or something like that on a Saturday. And like, you know, um, but so what I figured I would end up going with, uh, well, I was considering a couple of things. Uh, I thought maybe what I would do, uh, I some considerations before getting to the actual sort of uh, what I ended up doing, which I just ended up, and I don't know how often this, you know, becomes part of the case, but it was something related to watching TV at the time is just going with a movie that's on at the time. Because happen. sometimes yeah. on a Saturday... Because there's like I was looking at like the the SNCC lineup and sort of I thought about maybe like you know Keenan and Kemp, but the SNCC lineup has like you know Rugrats and like Animorphs was on at this yeah, time. Yeah, Rugrats That's, is the strongest part of this lineup in my yeah. opinion. Yeah, and like but this was when like Animorphs was on and like that was like you know having yeah that's one I didn't watch when it was on, but I watched some of it when I was reading my Nickelodeon book and it's pretty brutal. <laughs> Keenan and Kel's a little better, but I looked at the premise and it's like the most sort of like. 90s multicam sort of premise I've seen it a million times I never believe this but uh, Kel creates a painting that somebody thinks is actually a great work of art and Kel is you know positioned as like a next great art wow. genius and then he gets a big head you know it's like a literally like I'm gonna watch that uh, now I'm in so yeah. intrigued there's a literally uh, in my uh, 99 episodes book the episode of the Wayans brothers I covered is about Marlin having that exact same experience. <laughs> uh, and, I mean, if you want to have a certain kind of 90s television experience, you could watch USA and watch La Femme de Quito followed by The Net. Yep. But uh, I definitely started watching, you know, The Net just for the amusement of that. But what I ended up, it depends on whether or not I had access to the premium channels. Because if so, then I would watch Air Force One on Showtime. Fair enough. Otherwise, I'd watch, I believe it's airing on, I gotta, I'm going to go see what channel was airing on, on TBS, I'm going to get you sucker. Which is a great movie. Yeah, so it's like, I mean, one that, you know, but it's like, do I watch Air Force One on Showtime without the commercial breaks, or do I do it's more of a 90s thing, watching I'm going to get you sucker on TBS with commercial <laughs> breaks, you know, it's just like... There's, what am I? There's two, and those commercials would have been all for 10, 10, 220. Um, <laughs> there's two things that intrigue me this night. One is a movie I've never heard of. It's on the PBS station, and it's called Hawks, and it's from 1988. Mm. And it stars Timothy Dalton and Anthony Edwards. Mm. And the, the it, this is such a bizarre concept. So it's a British movie, and it says two cancer patients escape their hospital beds for a final pilgrimage to a Dutch brothel <laughs> and it's Anthony Edwards and Timothy Dalton, who I cannot picture interacting with each other at all. Yeah. And then the other thing was, if you're a big Anthony Edwards fan, this is a real difficult choice because on at the same time is a live 90 minute special, Larry King meets ER and it's Larry mm. King live interviewing the entire cast of ER, including Anthony Edwards, George Clooney, Juliana Margulies, Eric LaSalle and Noel Wiley, which is, I'm wow. intrigued by now. Just seeing Larry King and George Clooney would be entertaining to me <laughs> enough. Um, so that I'm like very, very interested in. Yeah, that yeah, that could be definitely something in in the mix there. Uh, yeah, and then like a couple things during that evening that aren't during that that time frame is that uh, apparently by this point, Celebrity Deathmatch was on. Yep. Uh, very MTV. popular. Yeah, and I think the episode is like I saw there's like Puff Daddy versus somebody. Uh, Celebrity Deathmatch uh, is in my book. <laughs> so it's just like you know the idea of, of like. A, and then um, there was an ad for uh, the for the episode of Matt TV, and it featured uh, a face that you know while was around at the time. I feel like was became more famous. That's Jane Krakowski. It's yes. a old school curly haired Jane Krakowski. You know, pre Jenna Maroney and all that sort of stuff. Uh, back when I guess probably she was on Ally McBeal. Yep. And uh, yep. yeah, she was appearing on uh, Mad TV there. I should mention and, uh, when I had John Brennan on, he wrote them a letter for Celebrity Deathmatch and they gave him his Celebrity Deathmatch claymation figure. Oh. He has it. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, that's a. Uh, yeah, they yeah they uh, they you know some people there's always like you know the uh, some well it's with anything but parody some people love it and they appreciate it and some people you know 
And sometimes their parody was, you know, a little mean spirited or, or, you know, worse of the viewers, like a little one note and sure. obvious, plenty of obvious jokes, you know, Roseanne Barr, she's going to be eating stuff, you right. know, but uh, yeah, it's nice to have people and, and then that they would, you know, in turn recognize the, uh, the benefit of that and, you know, send their, the figure, the figure over. But that you know that fell outside of the you know oh, yeah, the yeah. time frame. But you know if after that time frame, I'd definitely be tuning into Celebrity Deathmatch because uh, I'd have to you know be able to talk about it when I got to school of course, on Monday. Yeah. Be like, oh yeah, of course I I saw that you know There's, Celebrity Deathmatch. Speaking of outside the time frame, like uh, the seven eighth annual Miss America pageant is on, and yeah. I did used to watch the pageants, but I actually kind of really like the tagline and the angle they've gone within the ad here. It says the only show on television with fifty one possible endings, <laughs> which is kind of a clever take on that. Um, I do want to mention at ten o'clock the episode of Baywatch. Uh, oh. guest star Shadow Stevens uh, friend of the show. Uh, a sleazy reporter played by Shadow Stevens which is already I'm like this is already going to be funny uh, starts dishing the dirt about the private lives of the Baywatchers on his show including some juicy scoops <laughs> Oh, wow. and then the show Nightman is on which do you remember Nightman speaking of sci-fi channel <laughs> Uh, I mean, it's the sort of thing where it's, I recognize the name, but I couldn't place what it was. This is about a guy. It was based on a, a, a I think it might have been a Marvel comic. Stan Lee was involved in some capacity. Mm. But it's a guy who is hit by lightning and then can is attuned to the frequency of evil. <laughs> <laughs> and he plays the saxophone and oh. so he can sense evil and it is just wonderfully bad uh so thought yeah. i'd mention that um there's also an ad for rising star barbie which is rising star barbie i wrote that yeah, down yeah grand old opry barbie that is five installments of 17 dollars and 80 cents so this yeah. thing's almost 100 bucks um you know what i need to i'll look i'm curious yeah, what these so are going is, for on ebay yeah because right there's a couple of because another ad i've mentioned i, I noticed later is also sort of country related so i wonder with the cmas episode if they were hitting it heavy with country related ads because they yeah, were just talking about it at the time later there's an ad for an alan jackson commemorative plate sort of thing right right and so it's like oh yeah they they're going for their particular audience in this issue you get your rising stars barbie uh Chris, alan what, jackson. what would you guess sort of the average price for a boxed mint rising star barbie on ebay is right now hmm Let's go with. I'll include sh include shipping too. Just I'll include shipping. Okay, if it's still in the box, oh, uh, I want to go. I want to take a bold swing and say it's like four hundred and fifty dollars. Twenty dollars. <laughs> oh, the so exact opposite. It is. Uh, it is worth one fifth of the original price. They saturated the market. I was like, either it's going to be big, or it's. It, it was obviously going to go one way or the other, as those things do. It's like. So they must have saturated the market with them. It's also not that exciting of a Barbie. Like the, no. the dress is really badly designed. It looks like a turban, but a yeah. whole body turban. Yeah. And it comes with a microphone, I think. That's kind of the coolest thing. Yeah. Uh, Sunday, what'd you do? Well, Sunday, 8 o'clock is easy. It's a season premiere of season 10 of The Simpsons. And now, to be fair, season 10 is the first sort of like cracks in the veneer of The Simpsons sort of season. Because uh, seasons like two through nine are basically Im unimpeachable. A couple episodes maybe fall to the level of only being pretty good, but it's mostly just like the greatest like stretch run of like any show in the history of time, in my opinion. I think it's the greatest show of all time, and that's. But season ten, which is like the last season I ever got on DVD, because it was the first season where there are some episodes that just aren't that good. There's a couple of dicey episodes in that season. I think that's the one where Lisa Kudrow uh, voices like a cool girl. Yes. And there's and it's also the one where they like the Loch Ness monster gets a job working at Mr. Burns's like casino. Like they meet the Loch Ness monster and he gets a job at the casino. Yep. And I remember distinctively, uh, I was wa I was watching that episode on the DVD with the audio commentary, and the legendary Simpsons writer George Meyer was on that particular episode of the commentary, and. Uh, when um, the scene comes up where, you know, the Loch Ness Monster is working at the casino, he sort of like deadpans, well, now I've seen everything. <laughs> and then there's some like nervous laughter from like Mike Scully and the others. But like, yeah, maybe that was a, a little silly. But the uh, this particular episode is still good. It's the one where Homer that wants to become an inventor yep. in the vein of Thomas Anderson, uh, Edison. 
and it's still a solid episode. It's still, you know, uh, good, and you know, it's not certainly not like a classic episode, but uh, you know, I'm I'm watching that for sure on this particular evening at eight o'clock, and then I will be sticking around at uh, eight thirty to watch that '70s show. Uh, which would have been maybe in its first season yeah, I think at the this time was, still. Uh, first or second, yeah. A, yeah. a funny show tainted by the fact that there's like three rapists on it. Yeah, that, that's a that's a thing. Is, uh, even before like, uh, you know, he was convicted and things were just trying to circle around. Uh, when I would try and like throw on reruns, I would basically have to only like, like watch teams without like hide in yeah. it because whenever he would show up, it just... It's like a very yeah. negative energy yeah. to like just like be experiencing while you're watching it. But at the time, and you know, in terms of like what the show is responsible for vis a vis quality, it's not responsible for criminal activities that you know uh, came to light years you know later or what have you. It was a fairly well done, pretty funny show sure. with some good, you know, teenaged actors who that this, that was before. The sort of um, Dan Schneider version of Nickelodeon right. slash Disney Channel version of Nickelodeon style of like teen actors and kid actors sort Speaking of like of creeps. Yeah, but like this sort of came a thing. Now it's like sort of like watching like that '90s show, or like trying to like you know see it. it's like it was starting like kids and like teens who like had come up through that sort of style of acting, which yeah. is very broad. Yep. Whereas, like, these kids can, like, act good. They, I mean, like, you know, I mean, some, they were varying ages from, like, you know, late teens, maybe early 20s. They, down they to, didn't I think seem Neil like they'd Cunis been acting like, since they were three. Yeah, and yeah. they, 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 they seemed like they had a normal style of acting, not a, like, I, they, like, kids, like, these days, like, they seem like they have, like, vaudeville, like, education. They all seem they like they're, like, Buster kind of vibe. yeah. yeah. They all seem like they were like contemporaries of like Judy Garland, sure. not like they were. They're like you know from modern times in terms of like their style. But yeah, that '70s show is the thing that I'd be watching at eight thirty, and then on a Fox, you know, Sunday evening at the time, the next thing would be uh, X Files. But I'm not necessarily a lover of the X Files, and I want to pay homage to like what I would have done, you know, assuredly at the time sure. which would be to put on some nick at night and so i would be watching happy days in laverne and shirley which is a nice you know obviously pairing there oh i could have watched oz encounters ufos in australia which i'm sure i saw the first time i was looking at this but it didn't hit me when i was seeing that but you know in the, back then i probably still maybe i would have been trying to not watch nick at night as much as i did you know it started as a to g- that's like the last couple of years when they still had old shows and then yeah then it was like no shows older than like 10 years and then it yeah. just kept which was very strange uh there, yeah. there's two things that intrigue me and and one and one is before um prime time but it's fox trying to to sort of make prime time on a sunday start at seven and they have a show on at seven thirty that I wrote that down too. God awful! I, I, it it looks, looks so bad. bad. It looks like a joke sitcom from a sketch show. <laughs> it really did. It's called Holding the Baby, and it just sounds awful. It's two guys yeah. and a woman and a baby, and <laughs> and this is the the premiere episode, and it doesn't tell you the premise. Um, but it says Gordon tries to pacify Kelly with a night out off well, from nannying after his constant paging puts a quick end to her first date with a new guy. And literally, I have not heard of a single person in this show ever, and I don't recognize any of them. Um, after we record, I'm going to have to look them up because I yeah. imagine this was their first and last thing. Could be. Yeah, because I know there's an there was an ad for the show in there, yeah. and the tagline is just you know, which is like what makes it seem like a like a parody sort of yeah. thing of just sort of like the idea of like I was like a because it was like it was something like the most mature ones, the one wearing a diaper. Yep, or that something is like exactly that. Yeah. the tagline. <laughs> uh, yeah, that was there, and also was something that is a very sort of like old school sort of TV thing is that I think. On like the, the the local Fox Sports affiliate uh, in this TV guide, they're showing a English soccer match, a Premier League match, but they're airing it during the evening, and it would have been like taped from like the day before, right. apparently. Which you so they're couldn't look this up is online. you know, <laughs> ba- yeah, back then in 1998, they would you know tape a 
soccer game and then put it on in like you know the evening the next day and there's a good chance you wouldn't have known what happened or you wouldn't have heard about it right or you know these days like one soccer is way more popular but also because they can you know air live yep. you can watch it on like streaming like you know people have peacock just to watch the Premier league and it's the idea of like yeah we'll just throw this game on at seven o'clock at night on sunday and you know it aired Someone the day prior it. yeah we'll <laughs> yeah still- there's a there's a made for TV movie directed by Walter Matthau's son Charles, and it mm. stars Walter Matthau and Carol Burnett as an elderly couple getting married. But also Terry Polo and John Stamos are in it. Um, oh, it's Stamos. called The Marriage Fool. I feel like this could be not that bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I saw that, and I just assumed it was some like movie I just had like never like seen, like some sort of like two two and a half star film that just sort of came and went. And it was not, oh, Silk Stockings is there. And that's something that is, well, right. Silk Stockings is in my book. <laughs> they only give this movie one star, by the way. Oh, I should mention. okay. So it's probably, yeah. yeah. The one about the cancer guys going to a brothel got two. So uh, mm. this is only half as good as that. Uh, Monday, what'd you do? Well, Monday is a uh, sort of, um, uh, well, what's going to end up sort of happening with my, oh, that's right. After first, I uh, was looking through this whole re this re TV thing from Columbia House. Oh yeah, which had a bunch of little different things. It's, it's on the way from Sunday to Monday, so I sort of oh yeah, so I got you can get of, like, Night Dark Gallery, Shadows. Kolchak, yeah, yeah, it was Kolchak. It was um, choose from forty classic videos. Own the first video for only four ninety five, <laughs> and then they're twenty four ninety five after that. Yeah, for a video with two episodes of a show on it. <laughs> Yeah, or in the MST3K case, just one just episode. One. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But um, there's some interesting sort of things on this evening, but things I hadn't really ever heard of or aren't particularly good shows. Like, um, the you know, like I don't remember Brian Ben Ben having his own titular sitcom, but uh, apparently that was the case there. And then uh, there's, you know, this is the era of, you know, some King and Queen, some show called conrad bloom which is sort of like between surly susan and caroline in the city yeah and uh yeah so it's like a lot of interesting sort of like we're trying things out on a monday with these sort of sitcoms situations and like something like will and grace would sort of like soar but uh you know something like conrad bloom you know not so much there so it's an interesting collection uh and like the brian brenben show obviously did not work out and i'm not mentioning the show that's airing at 8 p.m. on yes, some networks. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, but so uh, this was when Monday Night Football wouldn't end up starting until 9 p.m. And, uh, you know, Cowboys Giants, that's a good, you know, Monday Night Football game. It's that time of the year. There's not necessarily a lot of other good stuff on. I've never been particularly a fan of everybody loves Raymond, for example. This is the debut of King of Queens, by the way. Oh, um, the very first kind of episode. And it debuts against this show, Conrad Bloom. Yeah. This is the first episode. A young copywriter played by Mark Furstein, again, never heard of him, juggles oh. his career with the needs of the women in his life. In the opener, a hot date is cooled off by the <laughs> needy women in his life. I, that sounds god awful. Oh. oh, Mark Furstein is the guy who ended up starring on the usa show royal pain oh okay okay yes so that's where his career went when conrad bloom and probably another show we don't remember didn't work out you end up you know uh when hell is full mark feierstein ends up leading (laughs) a uh, usa when they're blue sky shows that's you know sort of where actors who didn't quite work in other elements would end up going but so this is the uh, debut of will and grace as well so both will and grace and king of queens debut on the same night i i thought that was like i remembered seeing that yeah this is the first will and grace that's why it's airing on a monday as opposed to during like a viable night for comedy because i mean to be fair you know it was at the time significant and notable that was a show with like multiple gay lead characters Mm -hmm. on the show and including you know one gay lead actor uh and so that was you know i could see them being like well we'll put this 9 30 on monday and if it finds its footing fair enough and if not we can sort of like wash our hands of it now of course you know it's like oh will and grace one of our great hits we'll bring it back we'll revitalize it it'll be one of the more successful reboots it lasts in multiple seasons as opposed to some of those reboots that just like completely died on the vine it's funny it's that like, the, the pick of the evening, literally the editor's choice of the evening, is the Brian Brenben by Brian <laughs> Benben show, which, although in their defense, like Dream On 
was a critical hit. Um, he was, I think he won some Ace Awards and had been nominated for some stuff. So this is like his network TV debut. Um, and the show sounds fine. It sounds kind of like, it's like a Murphy Brown riff. Yeah. But it's funny how two of the biggest, what would become the biggest shows of the next two decades <laughs> are debuting <laughs> that night. And the one it's the editor's choice is the one that didn't even last the full season. Yeah. Yeah. Uh... But yeah, some other things airing. Uh, there's an you know, Mr. Bill is on the uh, Fox Family Channel, whatever, probably just called the Family Channel at the time. There at eight o'clock, you know, that's a an option to watch. Other than, uh, or, or of course, there's you know, Monday nights always about professional wrestling. If one wanted to watch Monday Night Nitro, sure. and then I watch WWF, so WWF wrestling, yep. and watch Monday Night Raw, or watch. On the TNN, the National Network, watch Roger Miller remember. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's like um, no, Penn, Penn Teller's Sin, Sin City, City yep. Spectacular. Or Rome, uh, the, hosted by Joe Montaigne. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of like random, like, I mean, this was before football was like the last bit of like high ratings monoculture. But even then, you going up against kind of like football was, you know, on a Monday night, probably not ideal. It's probably still you know something watch because also that was i mean if i'm calling correctly i'm going to look you know that's when it was still on network television on like yeah. abc yeah and this so, was yeah. like i think the when did the world football federation or that the one that vince um mcmahon tried to do there was like a couple oh, yeah, of XFL. rivals xfl those had kind of had they come and gone already or were they kind of trying <sighs> to think, like football was dipping where they thought they could have a chance against it i think the xfl was a couple of years later still uh, I feel like that was like turn of the millennium, so it was it was nearby, but it was not quite there yet. But yeah, the, so like you know, Monday Night Football is still airing on ABC, and it would still be it's airing at nine o'clock. Now it starts basically just after eight p.m. because they realize it's like why are they starting right. a football game at nine p.m.? People on the East Coast are like going to be like trying to sleep or whatever. I definitely remember that uh, being the case, and then. Uh, a couple other things from uh, I from this section is that uh, there's a there's a little note around this time in the TV guide that Friends was entering syndication. Yep. There's a they made a point of saying, "Hey, Friends is going to be in syndication now." All you you Friends lovers yep. out there, and that um, um, called Columbo was airing on A and E at uh, some point in the evening. I think outside the time frame. I don't know which episode. I don't know if it says which episode it is. But I was like, "Oh, Columbo," because that's. Uh, Always a you know worthwhile show it seems to like watch. It's it's... Always airing on something <laughs> in every era. Yeah, these days it's now these days it's like cozy or like me TV or whatever. But like back then, yeah, it would have been uh, you know a network like A and E where uh, it would be uh, on and because uh, it must not be in the. I wonder if it's like on during the day or on in the evening. Maybe. It was yeah. like an afternoon -y show. Yeah. Um, yeah, this sort of thing. As I started going towards Tuesday, I see the Alan Jackson plate that yeah. you mentioned. It's it's it costs twenty nine ninety five. Um I looked it up on eBay right now. Mm hmm Average price fifteen dollars. Oh, so, so it's held up a little a better investment than the Barbie. And then the other thing right after it is this horrifying bisque doll called Tweety and me and oh, it's yeah. like this buck tooth baby doll with a, tw a tiny Tweety bird uh doll and it's four payments of 1999 so this thing costs 80 bucks i just looked that up average price for this 30 bucks so again you know not a good investment you're it's you've lost more than 50 percent of the value uh with this <laughs> Tweety and me doll <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so on Tuesday, I was looking at the, the TV guidelines also of note. And uh, once again, of course, sex with Sidney Crawford is being highlighted. This Excellent. time it says, romantic images abound in a report called Sex with Sidney Crawford, <laughs> an overview of mores hosted by the supermodel. Not surprisingly, most interviewees agree the best sex includes love, communication, and understanding. <laughs> let's so let's like, make this titillating and then make it really boring. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of in now Tuesday is a lot of interesting stuff uh, that's airing here, uh, new shows, um, returning shows because you know a, a September issue involves a lot of you know um, season debuts and in some cases series debuts yep. uh, because for example it's the season debut of both Mad About You and Home Improvement yep. and, um, and King of the Hill. Uh, <laughs> 
yeah, King of the Hill, which is uh, my eight o'clock uh, choice, was King of the Hill uh, there over at Home Improvement where Tim goes whitewater rafting. And um, the Mad About You episode was, I mean, it's like a season seven one and the plot seemed kind of sweaty. It's like, Jamie's locked out the house in a towel uh, yeah. and like uh, Paul took Viagra, Literally, very 1998. The ad says, Jamie caught naked, Paul takes <laughs> Viagra, Jamie's stuck in a towel. The wildest yeah. episode ever. Yeah, but and then like uh, there's also and I didn't end up choosing. Although maybe I I could have, but like I believe the series debut of Sports Night yes is this evening, and uh, also the oh the Guinness Book of World Records shows which uh, show I which I remember watching and like that being like not really about records but being about uh, a lot of like weird abnormalities and stuff like that and much more Ripley's Believe It or Not than a show about like oh this person's trying something crazy be more like. Check out, like, this weird medical anomaly yeah. sort of, like, situation. That sort of, like... And this is a night of, like, um, just shoot me with Anna Gasteyer and stuff like that. Yep. But what I've ended up... Uh, so, 8 o'clock, King of the Hill, which is a solid show. Uh, you know, it's got some partisans that like it more than me. But uh, King of the Hill, you know, I'll take that over that Mad About You and that home improvement. And at 8.30... Uh, I will be watching the Clueless TV series, which is something that is in the book. And so I checked it out for the first time for the book. It's good. And yes. It's very good. It's actually, that was the uh, kind of like a surprise to me. It is legitimately like a good, funny show. And uh, I believe uh, Rachel Blanchard is the one who steps into the yes. role of Cher. Yep. And she's a solid Cher analog. And yeah, I was surprised by, like, you know, I was like, okay, I'm going to check this out for the book and to see what it's like compared to the show. I'm like, oh, it's actually, like, funny and good and, and well-made. And so, like, yeah. Oddly, I, 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 the two series based on Amy Heckerling movies, so Fast Times based on Fast Times River and High mm-hmm. and Clueless based on Clueless, are very good and hold up with the movie. And Tim O'Donnell, friend of the show who I've had on, he he was the showrunner for Clueless. And oh. we talk about that when I had him on, and it's it's uh, it definitely put more work in than was necessary yeah. for that show. Oh, you can, yeah. And it, it shows. Yeah, it's very funny. Oh, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, so like, yeah, people like you know, you know, like the movie Clueless, but one didn't know it was a show or just assumed the show wasn't good. Uh, uh, both of us are here to say it's actually a good yeah, show. Yeah, Donald Faison and, uh, is in and, it, and yeah, I think yeah, um, uh, what's her name, uh, Stacy Dash. Dash is on it, and uh, Julie yeah, Brown. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, it's most of the cast. Yeah, most of the cast. And somebody else is playing the Dan Adea role as Cher's father. And I'm trying to remember who that Although, is. Although, oddly, at 8.30 is the debut of a, a stand-up comics sitcom, Costello, which is Boston Comics Sue Costello. Um, ah. Still around. She got this deal on Fox. Playing her dad on that show, Dan Hedaya. Mm. Ah. Well, that's why he couldn't be in Cool. Yes. He had to be on Costello. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then uh, at... The nine o'clock, I went with Spin City, which is you know a show we've been t- talked about a little yep. bit, you know with uh, Heidi Klum and like yeah, I it's it's a solid s- sitcom. I love it. It's yeah, uh, it's uh, I you know I watched some of it. It's just like like a lot of sitcoms. It's sort of like I know it's like the first episode. You got to sort of like some sitcoms. You got to sort of like get through and like it's something like you know. But it didn't. It's 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 definitely it's good. And like I mean, Michael J. Fox. It's like a really good cast and like a nice ensemble. Uh, and so definitely like of the shows here, it, it's not like upper echelon like sitcom for me. It's not like you know. It's like a, previously when I was on here, I think we were talking about um, and this is a show I had watched some of uh, before, but hadn't really uh, dealt into in a while. Was uh, is New Heart? Love it. <laughs> which yeah, I, I ended up getting that whole thing on uh, DVD on eBay, because that's when it wasn't streaming anywhere. And that show is so it's good. So, it like, holds up so well, and it, it feels so it timeless. Really does. It's so funny. Yeah, now it's available on Amazon Prime if people don't want to do what I do and did and buy the entire series on DVD. But it is really... I think it's probably... I, and I like the Bob Newhart show, but I think Newhart's a little better. I think better. it's better. I think it's better. I, especially especially by the third season when Peter Scolari's in yes. the cast and he and you know Stephanie have their thing going on. Yeah, that's, that's when it really picks up. But even those first couple seasons are good. Uh, it just it gets really good at that point. But that yeah, that's a show that uh, is such... Like, it's like... Of like the 80s sitcoms, it's sort of like... It's definitely... Up there, upper echelon is such like a Easy. really funny sitcom for sure. Yeah. But 
Uh, yeah. Speaking Spin of City. Scolari, at 9.30, the show Working is on its second season yeah. of Fred oh, Savage, yeah. and Peter Scolari is on that show. Um, but notably, uh, Dana Gould worked on that show, and um, Arden Marine was the first show she ever did. Uh, huh. So they were all on that yeah. show Working. And then uh, also during that time is uh, Hyperion Bay, which Bar- was Paul, Paul the- Gossler. This is his, yeah, exactly. His yeah, Saved like by a, the Bell pre NYPD ex- Blue Roll. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, his brief uh, sort of foray there, uh, and something called classic sport. But what I put for the uh, figured out for the uh, nine thirty as in lieu of watching a uh, working or sports night uh, on AMC. That's when the last half hour of Superman 2 is on. Nice. So I'll just catch that last half hour of Superman Fair 2, enough. watch Zod, watch Zod, Battle Superman. I've seen the movie before. I don't need to watch the whole thing <laughs> again. But, you know, I tune in for that last half hour. I'm going to get the, cul- the culmination of, like, the big fight between, uh, between you know, Superman and Zod and his compatriots. And, uh, you know, that's, you know, how uh, It's a good way to I ease into sleep, yeah. yeah. Uh, Wednesday, what'd you do? Wednesday is a uh, well. Wednesday was so also like with the one sort of day I um, was like, oh look at what's going on in Nick and I. Whatever. Wednesday was the one day where it's like out of curiosity, uh, what was airing during the day on Nickelodeon. I want to see what sort of the Nickelodeon uh, uh, was doing at this time. So in the like post school hours, uh, it starts with a show I don't remember. Apparently there's a Charlie Brown and Snoopy show at the time. Okay. And then it goes into Doug, which is, of course, like a classic of the era, followed by Clarissa Explains It All, followed by the Garfield and Friends show, which I do remember begrudgingly watching because it would, you know, be on. It's pretty good. Followed by, followed by Are You Afraid of the Dark, followed by Rocco's Modern Life. So that was sort of like the lineup for Nickelodeon at the time. I'm just skipping through and I'm seeing the uh, Jamie Caught Naked ad, which is some great Photoshop. Yes. It's definitely very believable. It doesn't yep. look like... Her not only does it not like her, her, it looks like her. She's got somebody else's hair yep. on her head on somebody else's body. Yeah, I don't even think that's a real towel. <laughs> yeah, it's it's it's, it's very. Uh, it's a paste up. I'd it. call it. Yeah, a it's up. really really false. But so on Wednesday night at well at four in the morning on Wednesday, I decided to write down that Harry and the Hendersons was airing the, uh, <laughs> the, the show movie. or the movie. The movie. <laughs> uh, yeah, as, as on at four a.m. I just like the sort of like things like oh. But at the 8 o'clock hour on Wednesday, uh, when Dharma and Greg is airing, uh, which, uh, and then, you know, Dawson's Creek and, you know, oh, Piranha, Wolf in the Water, it's going to be a very accurate thing, I'm sure. Uh, But this was an instance of me delving into what's airing on, uh, fittingly enough, Nickelodeon, and watching Hey Arnold, which is... A show that I thought was, you know, solid as a kid. I think it's great. But that's great. When, when I was, re- yeah, when I was revisiting that in adulthood from my book, it was better than I remembered. It's one of those things where it's got some stuff to it now, like as an adult, that is like sort of like more relatable sure. or appreciable. And so, like, yeah, it's like that's a solid, you know, Nickelodeon show. It's better than watching Blank Check on the Disney Channel, for example, <laughs> or Falling Down on Max right. uh, at the eight o'clock hour. Uh, followed by, and then at that I'm flipping. Oh yeah, Nickelodeon. Oh, there's a show called Journey of Alan Strange on it. Yeah, what is that? I have no recollection of that. Yeah, that one is one I was checking out for the book. It's not. Uh, it's about an alien who comes to Earth and is sort of being hidden away by this family. Is it animated or? And, no, it's live action. Oh, okay. It's like a t- kind of like a teen. And I watched like the first episode for the for the Nickelodeon book, and it was it was not good. It's like it's like yeah, it's like he's got these powers. He's like an alien with powers, and of course he doesn't understand Earth, and he's trying to figure things out, and he's being like hidden away. And so yeah, so that sort of like kind of you know conceit. It's sort of my favorite Martian kind of style Super, of like uh, flavor yeah. of thing. But it's like it's yeah, it's kind of. But instead of that. Uh, uh, in that half hour time frame, I'd be flipping up to MTV to watch Say What, which I, this, this is the Say What before Say What karaoke. So I believe this is just when they show music videos and have the lyrics yep. on the screen. Yep. 
a novelty. And that's, yeah, and that's good enough for me here to watch some music video. I mean, it's 1998, gonna watch some music videos on MTV yep. when that's, that's a, you know, an option. Uh, there's no VH1 in this TV guide, so I don't know if Papa Video might have been on or something like that, because that was sort of like, if I was watching a music video related TV show, it would have been Papa yeah, Video at the time, uh, which, you know, I learned a lot about it. I learned about, you know, a lot of different uh, musical artists. I learned that Elton John was gay. I learned <laughs> all sorts of things. <laughs> yeah. I was like, oh. Well, to be fair, you know, I was probably seeing that as, you know, you know, nine or ten years old. And it's like, oh, I was like, oh, no, Elton John is. He did some songs from, like, The Lion King. Right, right. I was like, oh. And he's this guy. I know, okay. Because, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, that sort of stuff that would pop up on uh, the uh, old pop-up video, which they brought back. No, no, I would say a few years ago, but I realize now it's probably like ago. a decade ago. Yeah, and it yeah. just didn't have the same magic because it's... No, yeah, I just remember seeing a uh, Lindsay Lohan music video yeah. on there, and uh, I was watching that at like, a, a brief moment in time. I will say, uh, her first album, not bad. Mm, I can't say. <laughs> it's really not bad. It, uh, so in the 9 o'clock hour, we have the season premieres of a couple of uh, sitcoms, uh, Drew Carey Show and Third Rock from the Sun, and I, I've had the, uh, I was watching a little Drew Carey Show recently because it was on, I think Antenna TV. It's on there mm-hmm. now. That's a show that like famously isn't streaming anywhere, and only the first season came out on DVD. So for years, once it was like not in syndication anywhere, it was basically impossible to come by. But now you can just see it on like Antenna TV or whatever. Yeah. And I'll say like. People give, you know, um, like Jerry Seinfeld, for example, a lot of shit for like his acting. It's like, oh, stand up turned to actor. And I was watching the Drew Carey show and I was like, Drew Carey is maybe half a step better as an actor yeah. than like Jerry Seinfeld. It's like people like focus on like, oh, Jerry Seinfeld, he's just doing this. this. It's like, oh, Drew Carey's acting is, you know, pretty lackluster but he's in this. so much more likable. Like he's kind of floating yeah. through the show, um, right. but he's so much more likable. I also mentioned <laughs> in this episode playing the character of Carl as Kevin Weissman, who was just on this show. <laughs> oh wow, yeah. But yeah, uh, the Drew Carey show, like revisiting it, it's like uh, it's because I watched that show in fits and starts, mm-hmm. like growing up, and it was like fairly funny and like, but like watch trying to rewatch them recently it's the comedy is like a little bit Broad. sweatier yeah, it's big. and like yeah and just like a lot of like you know a, a obvious like wind up of a setup yep. for like a punchline and a lot and what have you a lot as of gimmicks. opposed to yeah 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 a lot of that sort of stuff whereas like i mean now the show I'm going to be watching in the in this in the nine o'clock uh, half hour period is Sir Rock in the Sun, which is not exactly a show known for its nuance and subtlety, right. but it has like its broadness works better. Like I mean, because like John Lithgow is just eating this chewing the scenery in this like delightful hammy way in an Emmy winning way. He won multiple right. Emmys. For but that the show. premise Kristen is Stewart. is inherently broad. Like it's about aliens. Yes. There's Drew Carey shows like you know the premise is friends. <laughs> it's blue collar friends is the pl- premise of Drew Carey. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is more like a hangout sitcom, whereas like Third Rock has like that sort of high concept sitcom thing. It's yeah, we're we're aliens. It's kind of a journey of Alan Strange ripoff. Yeah, <laughs> it's funny as I say this. Like I went back to my favorite Martian for a reference point for Alan Strange, but like literally that same night, Third Rock is airing, and yeah, it's like it's a good, solid, funny, silly, multi-cam sort of sitcom. It's got those. It's got that old style sitcom where like. These days, everything is like so compressed on TV that they're like there are no like theme songs. This is a time when like they would do as an interstitial little animations yep. with music stings. It's like oh, they had that much time to fill that they could have like a music sting to transition them between scenes with a little animation of like mar like planets as marbles. That yeah. was like where TV it's was. It's like back the then. last gasp of that. It was like the almost yeah. exact tail end of it. Yeah. But yeah, so I watched the season premiere of this episode of uh, Third Rock, which involves, uh, in the previous season ended, uh, Harry had sort of, uh, he'd been kidnapped, and now here he's in a circus, and uh, that leads to, and also in a way it kind of ties into uh, the 930 choices, because it's also, so is the, the Drew Carey, because I was choosing between Whose Line Is It Anyway, the sort of show that made people think, 
all improv is like short form sure. goofy gamery and what when i used to do like improv for like private parties or whatever it's you know always be stuff like that because they want to see games you're doing like voices and stuff like that because that's the it's the fun version of improv you know which i understand you're having a holiday party you don't want to see two people doing a 20 minute sort of like right. scene of figuring out their sort of like improv or whatever but that news radio episode that season premiere so what happened between the last season of television this one was the uh the murder of phil yes. hartman yes and so in that third rock season finale from the fifth season the person who kidnapped harry was played by phil hartman yeah. and so they had to completely read right what they're going to do and this news radio episode is basically a tribute to Phil Hartman yeah. in a way by being a tribute to his character, but by means of tr- paying tribute to the comedy legend that was Phil Hartman. And that's a death I do like remember hearing about like at the time, even brutal. though like I was a kid. Well, it was such it a was, violent, yeah. crazy thing. It wasn't like you yeah. know, he'd get sick. It was, yeah, it, it, yeah. it was bonkers. And he was sort of I, at the height of visibility too. Yeah, because I think he'd probably just... Ben or oh no actually I feel like Small Soldiers came out the, the same year I yeah, think too yeah. I believe that was a posthumous release for him and I would have seen him in that and I just remember like my you know, my parents say something about that or whatever because it's like you know they're adults and they're always talking about a famous actor who was you know murdered by his wife yeah. who then killed herself like you know the most famous murder suicide since Gig Young you know it's like uh, yeah and so it's like the question is like if I'm like going back and like watching now, it's like, do I watch that news radio and have it be like it's tough, a brutal yeah. viewing experience, or do I watch the silly improv show that's gonna be like fun and like Ryan Styles is speaking of Drew Carey show, Ryan Styles is a funny guy yeah. and a funny improviser, you know, throw some column mark. Do I wanna watch scenes from a hat and watch Wayne Brady, you know, sing some like song yeah. to a person in the crowd, or do I watch actors like working through their real emotions yeah paying tribute to their slain you know colleague that's so a, that's really it depends on how i feel yeah, I, I mean guess, that's an that episode that day. i'm glad i saw when it aired but i really yeah and i love that show that's one of my probably top three ninety sitcoms i have no yeah. interest in ever watching that episode again yeah it's it is that sort of thing where like watching it after the fact it's sort of like when you would see like you know David Letterman getting back on after 9 11. Right. It was very powerful and worth watching. I'm not calling that up on you no, know YouTube it's not a fun or something visit, like yeah. that. It's like at the time, it's like, yes, this is necessary and cathartic, yeah. but it's not, you know, for revisiting. It's not fun. Uh, yeah. yeah. But as opposed to like Who's Line, which would just be, you know, silly. Silly. Yeah. And I noticed, and what I noticed you. you passed up the second season premiere of Two Guys, a Girl, in a Pizza Place. Uh, I, I did make note of it. A show I, that <laughs> isn't great, but I put on par with all of the NBC sitcoms like Single Guy and Veronica's yeah. Closet. And um, I think it aired for like four seasons. They got rid of the pizza it, place at season three and four. And again, that's a person, Ryan Reynolds, very likable, would never yeah. have guessed he'd be the movie star in that show. <laughs> Yeah, if it would be what Nathan what Fillion was, the, was the, on it, or was it Trailer Howard? Trailer Howard, yeah, who was yeah. great and was only in like one movie. I think she was in like yeah. Dirty Work, and that's it. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, that's uh, a colleague honored with tears and laughs. Yeah, is the, uh, it's rough. And I, they definitely did not shoot a new image to use no, for this no. because it's just a very generic image of the cast smiling. Yeah. Uh, it's not. Which is, it's uh, not representative of the episode. <laughs> yeah, very much so. Uh, On Thursday, what'd you do? Uh, Thursday, well, with Thursday, there's uh, some a couple of weird sort of like things on there's uh, a, that there's a ad i just want to mention for diagnosis murder on thursday yeah, I just saw and this might be the least accurate depiction of uh, dick van dyke i've ever seen I, it's caesar romero like they've drawn yeah. caesar romero this is not <laughs> dick van dyke in any way it's a hundred percent caesar romero they've done yeah <laughs> Uh, on Thursday night, if you are feeling, uh, you know, of a in a certain mood for something lowbrow, you could watch World's Wildest Police videos yeah. or 
Sexy Swimsuits on E! Just simply yeah. a show called Sexy Swimsuits. Or uh, you could watch O'Reilly Factor if you are full of hate. We could because this was the sort of the start of oh, yeah, like Hannity the Fox Collins News era. earlier. Yeah, Fox has started yeah. the before. Yeah, if only they could combine that uh, swimsuit show <laughs> with World's Wildest Police videos. That would be you know yeah. hit. But uh, yeah, I th- the shows these networks seem to be kind of uh, you know begging out at eight because at eight o'clock the you know ju- already a juggernaut of Friends is on. Yeah. As this Thursday night's must see TV, and I'm not the biggest Friends fan. I think it's a totally solid it's fine. sitcom. Yeah. Uh, it's, a, it's got a talented cast, and you know, does it always do the best with that cast? Uh, but it's like a big season premiere episode. It's the episode that came after the whole Ross says yep. Rachel's name the during his yep. yeah. So it's like, well, gotta check in for that, and also because then after that, I don't remember. Uh, Jesse. Yeah, but this I was, was Christina Applegate's show right yeah. after Married with Children, and it went for a couple seasons. Yeah, I was intrigued by. I was like, okay, was, well, I could watch the second half hour of Down Periscope, or I could watch an episode of Keeping Up Appearances on the you know the local PBS, so I could check in with Jesse. And it's it's I mean, new show. They've they're very much um, doing the hammock yes. because at nine is uh, an absolute must watch for me because it's increasingly becoming i think possibly uh or you know that's a lot of qualifiers (laughs) it's a it's maybe possibly even probably my favorite live action sitcom that now is a frasier i absolutely love frasier that's one like you know i it's like become like the the sitcom like i rewatch like the most and i just absolutely love frasier i now have a i got a print made on etsy of uh, Niles in the episode of uh, where he thinks he's high, and because uh, <laughs> it's, it's like one of my favorite episodes, and it's also uh, it was really like I had so I mentioned that in the uh, it was it is I think so mentioned in my my dating profile on one of my dating apps, and then uh, the woman I was dating most recently uh, we split up amicably because she had to move back out of state for work and uh, family reasons. Uh, so it's why I don't feel anything <laughs> too. I don't uh, about like having this on my wall. Uh, she also loved Frasier and loved that episode. So that was the thing that like what like, connected us at first is like, uh, oh yeah, that episode's so good or whatever, and like it's yeah, just like such a great image. But this is that's from like later in the show's run. This is season four, uh, I think. Or yeah, yeah. this is um, earlier in the show's run, and uh, it's yeah, F- Frasier is a uh, you know such oh, a sixth good season opener. Wow, season yeah, six, started, yeah. Yeah, I believe I saw it. I was like, so at the end of season five was when Frazier loses his job. Mm-hmm. And so this would be during the brief period of time where Frazier's not working, which lasted for, I think, like a few episodes that are solid. That's like, because I mean, there's a sitcom that would shake things up on occasion, uh, you know, uh, in terms of like the conceits like there's like in the third season like there's a uh, half the season like mercedes rules like the new boss right. they build them up the, uh, and break them down over and over yeah, yeah. and like uh you know he would um like and of course there's niles's divorce and then like by this point niles would be probably working through his divorce even i i'll I wonder when Mel, because eventually Mel shows up and Daphne starts dating. I should mention his... this is the first season of Must See TV without Seinfeld. Oh, Seinfeld yeah. had ended the previous season, so That's they're right. kind of making Frasier the anchor. It's yeah, in the Seinfeld the slot. Yeah, and you know, I I put it there because <laughs> Frasier rules. You know, you start with Friends, you get people watching with Friends, and then you got that nice hammock show with Jesse. Then you go into Frasier. And then I, I'm not going to be watching Veronica's Closet. Uh, it's, you know... But Dan Cortez is in this episode. Oh, well, if Dan Cortez is, you know, in the episode, uh, then, I, I mean, if they had some uh, MTV, you know, uh, what, Rock and Jock or something right. on, maybe I'd watch a little bit of Dan Cortez. But in the uh, 9.30 hour, the uh, options here are a little... You know, lacking. Uh, also, I wanted to watch. You know, the shaky dog after Rover Dangerfield. Watch the second or, half of Xena. <laughs> well, what I ended up doing was saying I, I just grabbing a half hour of the movie The Great Outdoors on I USA. Mean, that's a solid movie. 
Yeah, yeah, because it's just like I was just looking at it, it's like you know, do I want to watch some random college football game or the Emmy Awards fashion review? Yeah, you'd be seeing half all the stuff with the bear at that point. Yeah. <laughs> you mentioned this is weird on Fox. Um, there's a show called Fox Files. Yeah, and it says scheduled. Chris Cuomo looks at the rise in use of crystal methamphetamine. Also, how the Seinfeld cast has been spending their time <laughs> since the sitcom's finale. <laughs> two unrelated stories. I hope. Two, yeah, two very unrelated things. Yeah, it's it's. Uh, yeah, I thought for a second there when I saw this. Oh, is that like sort of like Fox's version of like hard copy or some yeah. salacious show like that? But then it's like, oh no, Seinfeld's in the mix. I guess it's just like a. Um, a like a catch all. catch all, yeah, Mag- yeah. news magazine, <laughs> like yeah, Seinfeld yeah, and, sort of like, and yeah. crystal meth. Fair enough. Yeah, sort of like yeah, it's like they're like news magazine, like they're sort of like Murphy Brown esque sort of Correct. show, but with yeah, with Chris Cuomo in the mix there, and yeah, because like yeah, this because Thursday night certainly at this point in time was still dominated by must see TV, even without Seinfeld. You still have Friends, you still have Frasier. I mean, Veronica's Closet wasn't as big as a hit. Uh, it only lasted a few seasons, I think. It did pretty Veronica's well, fun. but I think it was really dragged along by the, the you know, yeah, ER. I feel and, like, yeah. so it ended up, uh, one of the maybe more unexpected shows to end up in the book is Veronica's Closet, oh, sure. because I did an episode, uh, I wrote about the episode where Ted Danson shows yes. up on it. So then it's like, I was able to write about that whole idea of like, you know, bringing in people to try and like boost ratings and all that sort of stuff. So that's how Veronica's Closet, you know, ended up making it into the book as sort of like a touchstone for that idea. Much like how Third Rock, a better show, made it in as my, you know, Super Bowl lead out episode. Veronica's Closet got to be the, hey, remember when you like these two people together? Well, we're doing it in this show sort of thing. Because I think that, yeah, they're trying to keep the show going and it just, you know, wasn't really working as you know and obviously jesse didn't end up you know working there and then uh i mean friends and fraser because friends and fraser end the same year right. i believe i think they both end in 2004 yeah. so there's there's still a, a ways to go anchoring must see pretty TV. much anything between those and er did well yeah that's right yeah it's also i forgot yeah because i was just looking at the the time frame yeah if we're talking thursday nights uh at this time we have to mention the 10 o'clock show is er because that was absolutely massive And that went to like well. 2009 or something like that. Something crazy. Yeah, that went for a, a yeah, really long time. And uh, yeah, there's also like, you know, what I'd probably be watching is, you know, the Simpsons rerun. That would right. always invariably be, be airing on some channel at that point in time. You know, a rerun of Jerry Springer's. I'm excited on, for Friday because there's the debut of a really overlooked gem of a show. Um, oh. And I'll see if you picked it. Interesting. But um, I, I really see. love this show. But we'll see what we'll see if you. Yeah, let's look at that. Frazier loses. Oh, Jesse new from the oh from the producer of Friends. Well, that makes sense. Uh, <laughs> Friends wedding revealed. Uh, Veronica's new boss is Ron Silver. <laughs> <It's only laughs> Uh, after activist Ron Silver to steal a joke from. <laughs> I'm, I'm seeing the uh, diagnosis murder yes, mustache. Yes. It looks just right. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the inverse because like famously Cesar Romero would paint over his yes. you know mustache to play Joker this looks like the inverse it looks yes. like a mustache was painted on yep. the face it's of like white out. I made a mustache with white out yeah it really has that look to it uh, during Friday during the day I noticed that Pokemon was on which I just noted because like oh this was sort of like it gives a sense of what was going on yep. in the world it's sort of the start of that rising as a thing that would air oh the new dating games on on Friday morning Ray Bradbury Theater oh an episode of Muppet Babies uh, LAPD Life on the Beat oh the movie Newsies and I'm just saying things like <laughs> Steven, which is a thing that I will do sometimes and, and to Jenny what's on Jenny Jones guests learn who wants them to have a makeover yeah that was a popular theme yeah. for her and then uh, oh my god i just i got to the um cosby's hosting kids say the darndest things on that night <laughs> um yeah. which again a, a sweet little show that is ruined by him but the photo yeah. the way they've the way they've staged this photo it literally looks like he has a child's head growing out of his shoulder <laughs> like it does like i i don't even know man what? man this feels like this episode this uh, issue was kind of phoning in the photo oh it's terrible like what what have they done? <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, oh, wow. this is when the uh, Tampa Bay baseball team is still known as the Devil Rays. Well, uh, 
On uh, nothing of note on Nickelodeon at the 8 o'clock, 8.30 hour, because Life of Loopy and Animorphs is on. So I've, in the 8 o'clock hour, I was between a couple of things here. Well, I feel like I felt like at 8.30, I would end up throwing on probably Boy Meets World, sure. the season. I believe it's the, yes, season the, six. the last season. Yep. Yeah. When they were like sort of like a little bit older, and this like, is you know, I've never. This is the premiere of when Maitland Ward became their new roommate, who <laughs> later went on to become a, a, a pornographic actress. <laughs> ah, uh, well, you know, uh, Chris. Well, I say Chris go the other way sometimes, but not really. <laughs> they, She's written a, they, a biography about her journey from Boy Meets World to her current career. <laughs> well, you know. Nice work if you can get it. You know, it's it's a living, as a certain sure. dinosaur would say in the world of Flintstones. But also, uh, I thought a couple of other options I considered was, uh, so this was, you know, rise of cable news networks. Uh, this is when uh, the with Big Show with Keith Olbermann yep. was airing, and so, which is, that's a name sort of borrowed from when Keith Olbermann, who you know, rose to fame as one of the... Uh, sports center anchors on like what they would call the big show on this is when again we're talking about being able to air a soccer game in prime time that was played the previous day this is when like sports center was still a thing you would watch to like find out what had happened to get because i mean this is i think the website espn.go.com was in existence right, at this right. time back when it was uh, but like it was still this would still be like when I would read the newspaper in like the morning and like if say the Red Wings had been playing in San Jose, they wouldn't have the score because the game had ended too late. Right. And but if I watched Sports Center that morning I could, you know, catch what happened and like so Keith Oberman rose to fame from that and then of course he pivoted his career out of the world of sports kinda of like um Craig Kilborn yep. did. Uh they were the two that sort of did that. So some others certainly tried to do that. I don't think Dan Patrick, who was the other one on the big show with Keith Olbermann, ever really managed to do that. Um, I, uh, Kenny Mayne kind of tried to do that, and it didn't really work out for him. He tried to do some like comedy stuff, and he sort of ended up disappearing. But Keith Olbermann and Craig Coburn were the two sort of sports center faces that managed to build careers doing something else. And so that's a very sort of of the time thing. Or there's also Beetlejuice. That's true. That's true. <laughs> Uh, Beetlejuice is on, and that's, you know, and now that, you know, Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice, as it's, you know, being called, is coming out. And they shot it a block from where I'm sitting right now. Ah, I am, as they say, cautiously optimistic about it. Uh, just, I mean, Catherine O'Hara is back, yep. and, you know, Michael Keaton mm-hmm. and Winona Ryder. And I'm sure it'll be big because, you know, Tim Burton was able to get Janet Ortega in there, who's like, seems to be the Gen Z Winona Ryder. The interesting uh, in a, thing about it for me is there was a neighborhood in this town that was just decorated for Halloween, like for six months. <laughs> that's, yeah, it's interesting because, like, I mean, back in the day when there used to be like film credits in the state of Michigan, a lot of stuff was shot here, and a lot of stuff would be shot in Detroit. This is also at a time when uh, people were talking more shit about Detroit, so like they'd be like doing like a um, like scene for like some like Transformers movie or something and people would be like, oh, how can you tell the difference between this set with the yeah. flaming cars and it's like, uh, it's like, come on. Now Detroit is like, you know, really builds itself up. You know, well, I just had Michael nice Pressman on who directed Dr. Detroit. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, another Detroit legend, Dr. Yep. Detroit. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, uh, um, so yeah, I, uh, but yeah, it's sort of like, I feel like the, you know, it's good. I think Beale Juice may be big and also the Jenna Ortega. I feel like someday, I remember there's like a, one of the, I believe it's an Onion headline. It's one of the Onion headlines that stick out to me the most. Uh, when Nona Ryder finally agrees to sleep with Generation X. <laughs> and I feel like someday they could do the headline, Jenna Ortega finally agrees to sleep with Gen Z. Yeah. I feel like that's sort of like the same sort of like. Sure. Yeah. Uh, but um, and so then uh, in the nine o'clock, time frame a show that i'm not familiar with but really intrigued me is on called buddy That's pharaoh the show i was talking about uh it's a great show it was one season okay it's uh it's frank whaley uh been on the show uh who's always yeah. great and everything very funny and it's a detective a comedy drama detective show with frank whaley and dennis farina and dennis, and dennis farina is like this cool rat pack 60s guy who's now like an old loser 
and it's so oh. good. It's sort of got, you know, it was, it was, I think it was greenlit in the, um, in the wake of swingers. Like it, they kind of, mm, that's like right, how they kind of right, sold right. it, but it ends up being more like Rockford files. Um, oh, like a, I, like a much less silly version of the look well show that failed pilot with, um, Adam right. West. Uh, or the Andy Barker PI. Yes. It's, it's a very fun show and it was good. And uh, again, it was one season. I think it was, probably too early for people mm. to uh, it's very cinematic um, ah, but it's a yeah. great show uh, i think it might even only be like 17 episodes that got on Interesting. Um, if it's i love it streaming somewhere i'm gonna look after the after we're done i'm gonna definitely see if it's streaming somewhere or something because yeah. it looked intriguing to me like i don't remember it i didn't watch it at the time i wouldn't be like oh hey dennis farina's in a show i gotta check that yeah. out now now that, that was the thing i was like oh dennis farina was on yes yeah. and he's sort of great he's that. really funny and yeah it's up against millennium which is a show i really loved but millennium's a repeat yeah. and i remember being very excited for buddy farrow and i've i've gone back and revisited and it's still good yeah but this was already at a point where other than like you know tgif friday was still kind of already like the death night for shows yeah. i feel yeah. like because i mean back in the day like famously like the mary tyler moore show would air like on saturdays which is like insane to oh, think yeah. about Bob now. Newhart show too but yeah friday yeah. night the, the audience for buddy farrow was not at home at nine o'clock on a Friday. No, they were out at whatever club they should have in the movie. Yes, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, yeah. That, that was like a 10 yeah. o'clock on a Wednesday show probably would have done. Better, yeah. But, um, yeah. They, yeah. I, I wonder maybe they didn't have, I mean, they pr- didn't have faith in it. They put it at nine o'clock on a Friday night. They, they, they greenlit it and they probably got cold well, feet. I, and I, it was a CBS show. And I think CBS okay. did not know what mm, the hell they were bit, doing yeah. then. And Nash Bridges was on it at nine and uh, Buddy Farrow, I mean at 10 and Buddy Farrow oh. was on at nine and Nash Bridges did well. Okay. And I think yeah. they seem to think they were similar shows, but they're definitely right. not like the Nash Bridges audience is like a touch by an angel sort of, yeah. it's like Nash Bridges was sort of the Venn diagram intersection of the audience of touch by an angel and Baywatch. That was Nash Bridges. <laughs> Buddy Farrow was like so much different and better than that, that I, there was no overlap, but I could see if, or some CBS executive being like, yeah, detectives, and they got ca- cool cars. Yeah, it, it makes sense. And it just, it's its a bad, bad move. Yeah. That, yeah, I, I've never really seen Nash Bridges, but it's kind of probably like I, a show like I saw, I've seen some of a little bit recently that was way sort of like sillier and like goofier. And then I had always imagined the band, like sort of like more cheesy procedural was like, the show Bones. Oh yeah, with I like, love that show. It's a comedy. Yeah, yeah. I I was I honestly did not like know that, but like it's on all the time on like a cozy or something yep. like that. So like I, I I was watching like the uh, you know NFL playoffs, so I had like my over the air channels on I'm on my antenna, and so I'm looking the stuff to flip over, and occasionally like Columbo's on or like a good game show's on buzzer, but sometimes like you know let's make a deal's on buzzer or like um, you know this and it's all it's on is like. It always seems like Monk and Bones is always on some channel. Could be worse. And so I was like, I'm just going to like flip over these things. So I flipped over the Bones and there just kept being so many like jokes yeah. and like silly stuff. I'm like, this is not, I thought it was like, like a, I didn't think it was like necessarily like, you know, the heaviest of dramas or something like that, like The Wire or something. But I didn't realize it's like, oh, this is like mostly a comedy. <laughs> yeah, it's like a USA network kind of style yeah. procedural, like a psych or a monk or like, you know, you met now if Buddy Farrell is really like Rockford Files, that's right in my alley because Rockford Files is maybe my favorite of those old school procedurals. Oh, love that's, Buddy like, yeah, Nash, that's like the perfect tone. Nash Bridges is sort of what you're describing, but in a much yeah. dumber way. Like right. it's, a, it's yeah. yeah. A Cheech Marin's the it's, comedy yeah. sidekick. Yeah. Like, <laughs> it's it's not. It, it's very. It's not objectionable, and it's very middle of the road. It's very right. Like, you know, your average person's going to enjoy this. It's not right. super memorable, but yeah, it's not. You know, showing up uh, on like the cozy or the yeah. whatever. And it stayed on and for like, a while too because it was shot in San Francisco, and San Francisco was really pushed because San Francisco is for a long time, uh, really up until after that show, Nash Bridges ended, has always had a show that was on for a long time that shot in San Francisco. Midnight Caller was before Nash Bridges. You know, before that, you have, like, Streets of San Francisco. So, like, they gave a lot of I don't know if Monk is actually shot there, but Monk's set in San Francisco. Yeah, I think that's in Vancouver. Um, That would make sense. I feel like it's with the USA. Because I know, like, 
psych would just send him to Santa Barbara, shot in Vancouver. Right. And once, like, every couple of seasons, they do an episode where the whole crew had to, for some work reason, go up to British oh, Columbia. It's like, it's oh, here trip. we are. Yeah. We're in British Columbia yeah. now. Sure, you see all the same actors, all the same local hires, but no, they're not in Santa Barbara anymore. Yeah, but, but like Bridges a, was legitimately shot yeah. there, as was Midnight Caller and True San Francisco. Yeah. So I, I think that was part of the reason it stayed on for a long time, too. Yeah. It was, you know, and it was also, it's Don Johnson's show right after Miami Vice. Like you can't say yeah. that short. Like, you know. Yeah, for sure. Um, so that is the week. Uh, the book people can pre-order now. It'll be out very yep. soon. Uh, the ninety-nine episodes. I'm curious to see the rest of them. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, we'll have to have you on. What's the next book? You're already working on it. Uh, I'm I'm thinking through some ideas. I I do kind of want to. So I've now written three books about '90s television, and I've gotten more expansive with each one. I started my first book is about Mystery yep. Science Theater 3000. My second book is about '90s Nickelodeon. This book is about '90s TV in general. So my thought is like, do I want to do something more expansive about TV or do something more expansive about the '90s? And I'm kind of thinking more about the the latter. Try and expand as a culture writer a little bit more. And, you know, because I... Well, trying to sell books, like, having a niche was great. Because, sure. like, I've written these books about 90s TV. I can do this sort of thing. But hoping I'm hoping that maybe I've found enough of a footing that I can, you know, explore things a little bit more. I've also been banding about an idea book-wise, writing a book about, you know, in capital letters, like the suburbs sure. and sort of like the idea of like suburban culture but also culture about oh, the suburbs so like yeah like the burbs or like sitcoms are in the suburbs the idea of the suburbs all the sort of like uh things that are anti people like you know complaints about the suburbs music about that sort of thing like the sort of like but also beyond like sort of like the idea of like sort of like you know the food of the suburbs the mu- the music of right, the, the suburbs as opposed to and, yeah yeah and just sort of like, so I've been sort of like, because I, I haven't like landed on a book sort of thing that, you know, it's like, oh, I've, you know, hit it out of the park. I've nailed it. I've, I've landed on it. But, you know, I've, I enjoy the process of writing the books. I'm doing my other sort of, you know, writing stuff that I do for work and what have you. And um, I also have just started a, a sub stack uh, trying to like do that sort of thing as, as well there. So now, uh, if, uh, if people want to read my sort of culture writing about whatever, uh, it's uh, chrisxmorgan.substack.com. Yep, and I'll put links in the show description here yeah. so people can just click uh, right it's, on it's, it. It's, it's, it's titled My Substack Could Be Your Life, but the actual link itself is chrisxmorgan.substack.com. Cool. Uh, so that's where I'm putting like sort of like my own sort of thoughts while I'm you know working towards the next thing and then just writing about whatever I want. Like I, I wrote about the movie The Return of the Living Dead the other day just because I wanted to. I wrote about the Lisa Loeb song Stay just because I wanted also to. Also former guest of the show. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate, uh, so like when I was like writing about that song, I remember that on uh, Mystery Science Theater 3000, one time they had done like a host segment where um, Bridget Jones Nelson uh, who would appear on the show sometimes as an actress. Uh, she was also married to Mike Nelson, who was a host for a while there. Uh, was playing Lisa Loeb in like sort of like a you know a parody of sort of like a sort of '90s stand side, and I wanted to include that clip in my you know Substack piece, and I found it, and it was on Lisa Loeb's official yeah, she's YouTube cool about page. That stuff. So yeah. I was like, "All right, Lisa Loeb, yeah. you know, right on." Yeah. So yeah, she's you know good in my book for sure. Cool. Uh, but yeah, so when, you know, whatever the next book will be, uh, will, is, you know, whatever it will end up being, uh, and I'm hoping, you know, expand more about what I cover in the book and also maybe expand more in terms of where the book ends up or what have you, but that's, yeah. well, you I'll know, be, to be, be decided. looking out for it. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Until then I'll just be, you know, watching Buddy Farrow yep. if I can find it. <laughs> There you go. That's Chris once again joining the show. Uh, probably have him on a third time when his whenever his new book is in. I don't know, two years, year and a half, whatever it is. Uh, buy that book. I put links in the show description. Buy his other two books too. You can't go wrong. I mean, seriously, get get a Kindle book. It's like three bucks. I don't know how much it is right now, but normally they're pretty cheap. Uh, I've, I've switched to almost exclusively uh, audiobooks and eBooks just because I have. 
on Adam Adam's Space. But that's a different discussion. And join the Patreon, discuss your favorite 90 shows, or just send me a message. And I'll be here next week, I hope you will too, for a brand new edition of TV Guidance Counselor. I've been throwing more praise at Tim Allen than I ever imagined I would be doing it.